story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Well, we finished the last talk just where we start the second one, uh, looking at the three talks that Moses gave during his last week to the next generation of the children of Israel as they camped this side of the Jordan. The first discourse, chapters 1 to 4, he looks back into the past, and he looks back to the days after Sinai when God had made the covenant with their parents, and he said it only takes 11 days from Sinai to the Promised Land, and yet your parents took something like 15,490. Why? Well, the answer was lack of faith. They did go straight to the Promised Land. They got to a place called Kadesh Barnea, which was right on the border. And there they paused, and they sent one man in from each of the 12 tribes to spy out the land and come back and tell them the best way to go in less than a fortnight after Sinai. And the spies came back and they said, it's a wonderful land. They came back carrying huge uh, clusters of grapes from this land flowing with milk and honey. That's now the Israeli tourist board symbol. If you have ever been there, you'll know. They came back and they said, the food's wonderful. But, they said, the people are bigger than we are. They're giants in there. Because the Jews are not tall people. They're little people, and they said they're big people in there. And furthermore, the walls around their cities reach the sky. We'll never take it. Now, there was a vote taken among the spies, and ten of them said, we'll never get in, and two of them said, of course we will, because God's bigger than all of them. And Moses said, look, we have been riding on God's shoulders. And I can remember as a small boy riding on my father's shoulders. And when you're on your dad's shoulders, you know you're bigger than anybody else. And you can look over the high walls. And Moses said, what are you worried about? But anyway, they took a democratic vote and the majority went with the ten and not the two. And that's when Moses said, none of you will get in except those two spies, Joshua and Caleb. And so it turned out. That wasn't the reason Moses wasn't to get in. It was much later that he disobeyed God and became very impatient. And God said, Moses, you're not going to go in either. Just Joshua and Caleb, two out of two and a half million people made it. And three of the writers in the New Testament use that as a warning to Christians. It's not those who start off, it's those who get there. And Paul and Hebrews, and Jude all use this fact that only two out of two million made it as a warning to believers. Make sure you make it. Keep on believing right to the end. They had everything in front of them, and yet their morale failed. In any battle, you need strategy, tactics, and morale, but you find in the long term it's morale that is the key factor. If people feel they're going to win, they will win. And if they feel defeated, they will lose. And many of the greatest commanders knew this. General Montgomery in World War II was a classic example. And he lifted the morale of the Eighth Army as it was pressed back into Egypt. And he simply talked to them and said, we're going to beat this chap, Rommel. And they did. It's whether you believe you're going to make it. And I'm afraid they didn't. And so, though God had been faithful to them, they were faithless. And chapter 4 simply says, children, don't be like your parents. They lost their faith and they lost the land. Now you keep yours and you can keep the land. It's a very simple sermon, if you like, and you don't need me to help you with understanding it. So let's move on to the main block of the book. Not so interesting to read. We're much more interested in stories than we are in legislation. It's like reading the telephone directory through. 
and uh, people get a bit bored. And yet it's a fascinating section. This second address is by far the longest, probably on the third day of that last week in Moses' life. But he gives them the way they are to live after God has given them the land, if they're going to keep it. And he begins with the basic principles of God's righteous way of living, his upright way of living, namely the Ten Commandments. They're at the heart of it. You learn them on your ten fingers. They're the very basic principles. And they're all about one thing. They're all about respect. Respect God. Respect his name. Respect his day. Respect your parents. Respect life. Respect marriage. Respect property. Respect people's reputation. And the quickest way to destroy society is to destroy respect. And that's exactly what we've seen happen in our own country, largely through comedy on TV. One well-known comedian whose name you'd all know said, we intend to leave nothing sacred. In other words, our objective is to destroy all respect. Respect for royalty, respect for the law, respect for the government, respect for each other. You destroy respect and you've destroyed society and the whole Ten Commandments are built on respect. And so we have in that first part those Ten Commandments. It's very interesting to draw a contrast between the law of Moses here and the worst laws in pagan society and the best laws in pagan society. If you contrast the standards of Moses' law with the worst, as we've already done with the Amorites already living there, what a pure holy law it is. How much healthier and happier people will be if they live that way. But there's an interesting comparison between law of Moses and another law which has been discovered from the ancient world called the Code of Hammurabi. An ancient Amorite king of a city called Babylon or Babel. If you go to the Louvre in Paris, do go and look at the steel or stone column that was found at a place called Susa in Persia and is now in the Louvre. And on that stone column are carved 282 laws of Hammurabi. And those laws were written 300 years before Moses. Many scholars like to draw comparisons and it's amazing when you do. No killing, no adultery, no stealing, no false witness. And these are all in the laws of Hammurabi 300 years before. And the famous law called the Lex Talionis or the law of revenge, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is also on that stone. And so many people say, well, these laws were pretty common. At least the King Hammurabi knew them. But you know, Paul in Romans 2 says a very interesting thing. He says, God has written his law on the hearts of pagans. He didn't just write it on stone. He's written it into the hearts of people. In other words, people know these things are wrong. God has written his law in their heart. They know it. Do you know that every society in the world has always thought incest was wrong? God has written these things on the heart as well, but he's also made them even clearer to us in the law of Moses. Having said that, there are some big differences between Hammurabi's law and the laws of Moses. For one thing, Hammurabi, there was pretty well only one punishment for anything, and that was death. Whereas in the law of Moses, the death penalty is quite rare, there are only 15 things in the law of Moses that deserve the death penalty. So by comparison, the law of Moses is not nearly so barbaric as people would say, not so harsh, not so cruel. Another huge difference is that in the law of Moses, slaves and women are people, whereas in the law of Hammurabi, they're property. And therefore, women had no rights and no respect in the law of Hammurabi, but they do in the law of Moses. That's a very interesting comparison. Another is that in the law of Hammurabi, there are classes. There are nobles, there are common people, and a different law for the different classes. In the law of Moses, the law of God, there is no such thing as class, and the same law applies to everybody.
Now, I'm just saying this because some scholars say, oh, well, the law of Moses is just one among many others. No, it's quite different. And though God has written his law on pagan hearts and they know these things are wrong, there is another interesting technical difference. I'll give you the technical name and then explain it. The, the laws of Hammurabi are what are called casuistic laws. They are presented in the form of a condition. If you do this, then you must die. If you do this, that's a condition. Whereas the laws of Moses are presented in what we call an apodictic manner. They are presented not as a condition but as a command. You must not do this. Now, can you see the difference? All the laws of Hammurabi are, if you do this, you'll be punished. The laws of Moses are, you shall not do this. Now, only God has the right to talk like that, you see. Human laws are usually casuistic. If you do this, then this is what will happen. But God has the right to say, you must not do this. I command you not to do it because he's the king of kings. So there are differences. Now, the rest of the section 12 to 26 covers a huge amount of ground and the detail is just incredible. I can only run through the headings for you and show you what an amazing amount of ground is covered. First of all, there are many religious laws. They cover pagan idolatry and that deserves the death penalty. They cover spiritualism. That has the death penalty consulting the dead and witchcraft. Blasphemy, dedication of the first and best fruits, tithing, and a special tithe every three years for aliens, orphans, and widows living in the land. Laws of the Sabbath. Now, that was totally new. Up till Moses, nobody had a Sabbath. Adam didn't, Abraham didn't, Isaac didn't. Jacob didn't. It was a new provision for slaves who'd worked seven days a week were now given one day a week free from work. Some people think the Sabbath goes back to the beginning. It doesn't. It came in with Moses and incidentally it went out with Christ, but that's another story. There is a law here about feasts, Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. There are laws about sacrifices. There are laws about vows. If you make a vow to God, you must keep it at the cost of your own eternal salvation. There are laws of separation. Now, I'm wearing my Oxfam suit, 15 pounds, <laughs> but it's a suit of mixed wool and polyester, mohair actually, 15% only, but I'm breaking the law of Moses. And it was a Jewish family that made me break it because it says Marks and Spencers. <laughs> See? There are laws you must not mix different kinds of cloth. You must not mix different kinds of seed in the garden. You mustn't mix this and that. You mustn't plough with an ox and an ass. Now, what is all this about? Very simply, all this was part of the old fertility cult in the land. They believed that by mixing things, they were producing fit fertility. Do you follow me? By mixing cloth, you were making your clothes fertile. And it's all due to that. God gives fertility. You don't get it by mixing things. And that's why the laws on mixture are in the religious section of Deuteronomy. Then there are laws on uh, government, and it's interesting that there are laws here for a king. And yet God was their king, and they weren't to have a king for centuries, and it wasn't God's will that they should have a king. And yet God knew that one day they'd want one. So he made some laws for the king, and one of the most interesting is that when a king came to the throne, he had to write out the laws of Moses in his own handwriting and read them regularly. Can you imagine our Queen being told in Westminster Abbey, you must write the Bible out in your own handwriting or even write the Sermon on the Mount out in your own handwriting and then read it regularly. Made sure that the King knew the law. And the King wasn't to have many wives or many horses or much money. And then there are laws here for judges. There's a court of appeal here. Death for contempt of court. 
There are rules of justice, no bribes, no favoritism. An alien, an orphan, a widow must get exactly the same treatment as the richest businessman. Aren't these wonderful laws? And then there are laws about witnesses. There must be at least two or three witnesses who agree totally on what they've seen or heard. And if they bear false witness, they must suffer exactly what the person would have suffered if they were found guilty. In other words, that's when it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And if my false testimony in court gets him fined a thousand pounds, then when I'm discovered to be a false witness, I am fined one thousand pounds. Absolutely fair, isn't it? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, good justice. And then the punishment, forty lashes maximum. There was flogging, but it was forty maximum, so they usually made it thirty-nine to make quite sure they didn't break the law. But it said beyond that, you are dehumanizing someone. You're just reducing them to a lump of meat. And a body must not be left hanging on a tree after sunset and made an object of ridicule. Actually, Paul applies that to Jesus on the cross in Galatians 3. It's interesting. Then there are laws against special crimes, murder, which always carried the death penalty unless it was manslaughter and unintended. And there were six cities of refuge set up where a man who'd killed accidentally could run to and escape the death penalty. There are laws against kidnapping, and that carried the death penalty, interestingly enough. Laws against rape, laws against assault, laws against stealing property, and particularly removing boundary marks. The way that each person marked his uh, little farm was with stones, and people would go out at night and move the stones a yard or two each night. And that was a very severe crime. There are laws of health what to do if you get a, an incurable skin disease. The word leprosy in the Bible covers a lot of different skin diseases. It's not just what we call leprosy today. Laws against eating animals that have died. And laws about clean and unclean food. You mustn't eat camels or rabbits or pigs or birds. Then there's this very strange thing which has been misunderstood by almost every Jew. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. And on that one verse, the Jews have erected a gigantic kosher system of diet whereby in the kitchen they have two completely separate pots and pans and sinks to wash them in and everything and keep dairy products over here and meat products over here. They have totally misunderstood that. That was again a pagan fertility cult right. To create fertility, you made the kid have incest with its mother by cooking it in its mother's milk. It was a fertility rite. That's all it was. And they were told never to do that, but they've now erected an entire kosher system of food on, on just one verse and got it out of all proportion. Then there are laws on welfare, that you must leave the sheaves in the corner of the field for the poor to pick up. There are laws of assisting your neighbour with straying animals. There's a law about when an ox is treading out the corn to separate the wheat from the chaff, you mustn't put a muzzle on it. It should be free to eat what it's treading out for other people. You shall not muzzle the ox when it is threshing corn. And Paul applies that to people like me, preachers. He said, well, a preacher's treading out food for you. <laughs> Send the hat round for him. That's what Paul says. Interesting application of the law. They're allowed to take birds' eggs from the nest, but not the mother. They're to leave the mother and she can lay some more. There are rules about warfare. They mustn't cut down trees in war because they're not fighting trees, they're fighting people. I thought of that law when America was poisoning the jungles of Vietnam and destroying all the trees. God says, you don't fight trees, you fight people. There's a way to fight. This is the Geneva Convention long before Geneva was heard of. Very interesting rules for soldiers' toilets. <laughs> and an interesting one for a soldier who'd got married. He can stay home for a year before he goes to war again. That's a wonderful law, really, isn't it? Give him time to get to know his wife and make the marriage solid. 
You don't go to war at the expense of marriage at home. Well, what do we make of all these laws? I've just skipped through them. There are hundreds of them. Well, first, the scope of these laws is interesting. It covers the whole of life, from your toilet arrangements to the way you worship, from your clothes to your cooking. God is interested in the whole of your life. Living right is not just what you do in church on Sunday. Living right is the whole of life. And this law of Moses tells us God is saying there's a right way to do everything. And he wants people to be right in the whole of life. The second thing I deduce from this is the amazing integration of these laws. I've classified them for you as I've gone through, but actually they're all mixed up. You go straight from a law about not eating camels to a law about the feasts. And this doesn't please the modern Western mind, and we must classify them. We like them all gathered under headings, do you know? But they're all mixed up. Why? Because God is saying there is no division in life. We tend to say this is sacred, that is secular. God never said that. It's all of a piece. It's an integrated, it's not only covering the whole of life, but it is a wholeness of life. Or to use the modern term, holistic. It's all together. And God is there whether you're sitting down for a meal or going to church to worship. It's the same. I've told some of you before, I think, that in the Jewish book of prayers, there's a lovely prayer to pray when you go to the loo. And to us, it's a joke. We snigger when that's said, the, not to the Jew. And it says, Lord, I thank you my body's working properly and I thank you I feel much better now. Hallelujah. Now, I go into many Christian toilets because I stay in many different homes and there's usually a pile of devotional books at the side and there are texts on the wall and neither the books nor the texts have anything to do with what I'm in there for. <laughs> and when you get old and you can't control your bowel and your bladder, you'll wish that you had praised the Lord when it was working properly. See, to God, it's all of a piece. It's a whole life, a holy life is doing it right in every part. The third thing I notice here is the purpose of all these laws. It wasn't to spoil their fun or to hedge them about with restrictions. There's a phrase keeps coming, that it may be well with you and that you may live a long life in the land. God wants us healthy and happy. That's why he made the laws. And then we think God's just sitting up there thinking, what shall I tell them what to do, not to do next, you know? Like the little boy who went to school and the teacher said, what's your name? He said, Johnny, don't. <laughs> and the teacher said, I'm sure you're not called that. Well, that's what mummy always calls me. And you know, there's this, this picture that God is just sitting up there and saying, don't, thou shalt not. Why is he doing it? He's saying that it may be well with you. And that's one of the first things we ask each other. Are you, are you keeping well? You know? Same as the word welfare. It was their welfare that he was concerned about. And that's why it's good to read all these laws. We must move on. The third and last discourse on the last day Moses spoke to them is in two parts again. In the first part he says, now you are to ratify the law for yourselves. When you get into that land after God has parted the waters for you and brought you in as he parted the waters for your parents and brought them out, when he gets you in, you to go to the mountain and you to go through all these blessings and curses and you to apply them to yourselves. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. I've been at Mount Gerizim and the few Samaritans left in the world are still there and they have the law of Moses. They don't have other books in the Bible, but they've got the five laws of Moses and they make little copies of their scroll with old tin cans and write out part of the law. That's the Samaritan language. That's part of the law of Moses. And they show you a very, very old scroll which they've had there for centuries, which that's a copy. They've got a big, it's about four feet high, the real one, and they display it for a certain consideration because they are very, very poor. It was a Samaritan woman who said, where should we worship God? On this mountain, Mount Gerizim? Or that one? You see? And Jesus said, no, 
It's not a question of which mountain, it's a question of in spirit and in truth. But there it is. And those two mountains are acoustically amazing. They've got a sort of hollow face facing each other, so it's like a gigantic arena with two peaks. And the blessings were shouted from one side and the curse from another, and the people had to shout Amen after each blessing and curse. Now, I did this on Sunday night. I was preaching in an Anglican church on Sunday night, and I said, uh, let's curse people, and I want you to say Amen after each curse. Cursed is he that curseth his father or mother. Amen. Cursed is he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. Amen. Cursed is he who leads the blind out of his way. Amen. Cursed is he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Amen. Cursed is he that lieth with his neighbor's wife. Amen. Cursed is he that taketh reward to slay the innocent. Cursed are the unmerciful fornicators and adulterers, covetous persons, idolaters, slanderers, drunkards, and extortioners. Amen. Now, as we read this on Sunday night, the congregation got quieter and quieter, and the amens died away. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, do you know why we weren't quiet? He said, because we found ourselves cursing ourselves. And what I've just read to you is from Deuteronomy 28, but it is in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer to be recited every Lent. And that congregation had no idea I was simply taking them through the Anglican Prayer Book. <laughs> but I tell you, churches are scared to use that service now because they're scared of upsetting people. But can you imagine the effect that would have if every Lent, every Church of England in this country curse those people in the name of the Lord. Incidentally, in Galatians, Paul says, if a preacher comes to you with a different gospel from the one Paul preached, curse him. People say, what can you do about preachers who are perverting the gospel? You can curse them. We have it within our power. Words are powerful. Blessings are powerful. Curses are. And the curse word is woe. And Moses said, when you get in the land, go up to those mountains, shout the blessings from one, the curse from another, and the people in the middle say, Amen. Ratify the covenant. And you'll be blessed and enjoy the land if you keep those laws, and you'll be cursed if you don't. The rest of the history of the Old Testament is just that. When you read Deuteronomy 28, it's like reading the whole history of Israel for the last 4,000 years. Because God goes on to say, if you just go on, and even after I've taken the rain away, you don't listen, even after I've sent enemies to occupy your land, you don't listen, he said, I'm going to scatter you over the whole earth, and you will become the subject of ridicule and jokes. Have you heard the one about the Irishman, the Scotsman, and the Jew? Deuteronomy 28 predicts that that would happen. And when you read Deuteronomy 28, you understand the whole history of Israel right up till today. God has been faithful. He's kept his promise to bless them and to curse them. They've been more blessed than any other nation and they've been more cursed than any other nation. It's the proof that there's a God and that he's the God of Israel. Chapter 32, Moses sings. At the age of 120, it says his eye is not dim. And he must have had a good voice. Moses, like many prophets, was a musician. Prophecy and music go together all the way through Scripture. David was a prophet, and he wrote more songs than anybody else for our Bible. But Moses sang, he and his sister Miriam sang when they got, got through the Red Sea. And Moses wrote a lovely song which is sung once a year in Britain. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. And we have the cheat to sing that on Mr. Sunday. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. But we'll keep a few atom bombs up our sleeve in case. But that's a Moses song. Did you know that? It's based on Psalm 90. And here he sings a song. And uh, he says, God is absolutely solidly dependable, unchangeable, reliable. He is our rock. 
and he is a God of faithfulness, and in him there is no injustice. You beginning to recognise a song coming? Sing it quickly. Where are you, Max? Get to the piano and we'll sing it. Uh, what number is it? Twelve, quickly. I'm getting short of time, so let's sing it quickly. Ascribe greatness. Just give us the note. That's fine. Ascribe greatness to our God, the wrong. His work is perfect, and all his ways are just. Ascribe greatness to our God, the wrong. His work is perfect, and all his ways are just. just sung the song of Moses. And it says when we get to glory in the book of Revelation, you'll hear the song of Moses again. It's a lovely song. God, he never had problems about God telling them to slaughter the Amorites. He said God is without injustice. He's faithful. He's good. Chapter 33, he blesses the twelve tribes one by one. And uh, he really was a prophet because he could see into the future for each tribe and he blessed each one. There's only one he didn't bless and that one disappeared. As you know, through the Bible, the twelve tribes change. They didn't all survive. Just as out of twelve apostles one didn't survive, out of the twelve tribes one didn't. Interesting parallel between the Old and the New Testament. Chapter 34 is the death and burial of Moses. Now, I can be quite sure and tell you that he didn't write this bit. <laughs> the only bit of Deuteronomy he didn't write. Presumably Joshua added it, but he died alone with his back against the rock on the top of Mount Nebo, looking across the Jordan to the land that had been promised, which he would never see. Actually, he did. He did get into it once, centuries later. And he had a chat with Jesus on top of one of the mountains. But he died on Mount Nebo and he was buried there. Nobody's been able to find his grave because nobody was there when he was buried. So did he bury himself? Well, you'll find the answer in Jude in the New Testament. An angel came and buried him. When the angel got to Moses, there was the devil standing the other side of Moses. And the devil said, this man's mine. He murdered an Egyptian, he's mine. And it was an archangel, Michael. And Michael said to the devil, the Lord rebuke you. And he got on and buried him. What a story. Amazing end. He only buried his body, of course. His spirit was with the Lord. They mourned him for one month. They tried to find his body. They couldn't. And that's the end of the story. Now, Deuteronomy is the most fundamental book to the whole of the Old Testament. It's the key to the whole history of Israel. Because when they went in, they only occupied the mountains and they left the valleys to the Amorites. And on a Saturday night, the young men from the mountains went down into the valleys to find girls. And that's when the whole sad, sordid story began. Soon they were living just like the others lived. And prophet after prophet told them, go on like this and God will keep his promise to curse you. Every prophet appeals back to Deuteronomy. Over a thousand years they managed to get everything God had promised them. It took them a thousand years from Abraham to David and they got it all. And in the next 500 they lost it all, as we'll see when we study the book of Kings. You can summarize the whole history of Israel in just two sentences. Obedience and righteousness brought them blessing. Disobedience and wickedness brought them curses. The book of Deuteronomy plays a huge part in the New Testament too. 
It's quoted 80 times in just 27 books. Jesus knew Deuteronomy very well, so much so that when he was tempted in the wilderness, in that same wilderness of Judea which Moses looked on with his dying eyes, when Jesus was in that wilderness being tempted, he used the Scripture to defend himself and he always quoted Deuteronomy. Isn't that interesting? Man shall not live by bread alone. Deuteronomy. See how important it is. The Sermon on the Mount is full of Deuteronomy. The Samaritan woman I've already mentioned, she said, should we worship God in this Mount Gerizim, which is our sacred mountain, or your Jewish sacred mountain in Jerusalem? Neither, he said. The day is coming when we worship in spirit and in truth. When he was asked to summarise the law of Moses, he summarised it in words from Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. One of the most surprising things, by the way, I forgot to mention, but it's so important, is this. Even through that solid section on law, the most common word is love. 31 times back there, in among all the legislation, it's love. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. There is no contradiction between law and love. If you love the Lord, you keep his laws. Paul said, love is the fulfilling of the law. And really it's not a matter of legalism, it's a matter of love. 31 times the word love comes in that section, 31 times the word obey comes. Because to love is to obey, because in God's sight, love is loyalty. It's to stay true to someone. It's to love them so much you want to do what they want you to do. That's a very important point because we sometimes hear law and love set against each other. They're not. To keep the law is an expression of your love for the one who gave it. So when Jesus was asked, what is the law? He said, it's to love. The two greatest commandments are to love God and to love your neighbour. And we remember, of course, that Moses and Elijah talked with Jesus. Do you know what they talked about? It says they talked about the exodus which Jesus was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. An exodus is to bring people out of slavery. When Jesus died on the cross, that was our exodus. Paul picks up Deuteronomy again and again when he puts the emphasis on heart religion, that what God is really interested in is not circumcised bodies, but circumcised hearts. Hearts that have had evil cut out of them and hearts that are free to love the Lord and to live right. Well, I think that's all I'm going to say about Deuteronomy. I hope it's given you an appetite to read it and uh, read those three discourses one by one and just think about them, get the feel of them, realise that this is all our history because we are now sons of Abraham and we've been grafted into the olive tree of Israel and therefore we're not reading a strange history about another people, we're reading our history. And God hasn't changed one bit and he will deal with us in exactly the same way he dealt with them. There's both blessing and cursing. There's obedience and disobedience. There's righteousness and there's wickedness. And if we think we can get away with behaving like all the pagans around us, we need to think again. God said to the Israelites, you go in and take the land from them, but don't live the way they're living, because if you do, I'll have to send someone else to take the land from you. And that is still true. As Paul says, these things were written down for our, as an example to us and for our good, that we might learn from the mistakes they made not to make the same mistakes, for it is still true that God desires a holy people who will also be a healthy people and a happy people. Amen.